Hi, and welcome to this recording by the Center for Teaching for Biliteracy on how to move a dual language program online. As many schools and districts across the country decide to offer schooling via virtual and hybrid platforms, we know that there are many questions about how to protect the goals of a dual language biliteracy program within this structure. There are also questions about what biliteracy instruction looks like in both synchronous or live and asynchronous or offline platforms. So today, we are all going to be answering a number of questions about what schedules, curriculum, instruction, and resources can look like. And we're also going to give tips for teachers and administrators as you all plan for this unprecedented time. And so we'll start with the first decision to be made, which is what will the student and days um, and teacher's day look like? And Crystal Ramos will help us answer this question. Thank you, Karen. So let's go ahead, let me get my PowerPoint going. I wanna make sure it is working appropriately. Is it, are we good to go? <laughs> okay, wonderful, I was getting kind of nervous. So welcome everyone. Um, I'm going to go through this portion of this session to talk about this burning question that we've all been being, at, we're all getting asked by many districts and it's how do we continue to schedule for biliteracy during distance learning? So let's go ahead and get right to it. So many school districts are close or have decided on distance learning or some type of hybrid model for the fall. With that being said, many districts have created monolingual schedules for their staff. We have gotten many questions and feedback um, from dual language teachers and administrators on how does this monolingual schedule allow my students um, biliteracy instruction via distance learning? And this brings us back to the biliteracy guidelines. The biliteracy guidelines, regardless of in-person instruction or online instruction um, during, with distance learning, stays constant. They're always going to say the same with that, we're always going to remember that is what we, it guides us. With that, with that, the question then continues to be, how do we continue to schedule for biliteracy during distance learning? So let's take a look at four components that can support teachers teaching for biliteracy during distance learning through a drafted 50-50 biliteracy schedule. Along with this constant understanding of the biliteracy guidelines do not change because of distance learning, the other four components that are constant as well is always making sure we are showing empathy and kindness to ourselves and of course to our students and our dual language families. We're always going to make sure that our dual language programs vision and pedagogy reflects the schedule that, it, that we create based on um, how we teach biliteracy. We're also going to then look at our content and language allocation to make sure that we are teaching social studies and science integrated within um, ELA, English language arts, and SLA, which is Spanish language arts, which then involves that fourth component of the integration of content, literacy, and language. So we're going to go a little deeper into the sample 50-50 by literacy schedule via distance learning. So let's go ahead and do that. So you see here, during distance learning, small groups really become effective instruction during your meeting platform. A, looking at Monday's schedule, group A would be focused on 15 minutes of morning meeting, again, to provide that empathy and kindness through building and fostering connections with your students. Then you have about 45 minutes of Spanish language arts integrated with science. This, of course, can be broken up into smaller groups where the teacher does a 30 minute whole group. And then the 15 minute could be interventionists and or instructional support staff to take a couple of students to work on same content with additional focused standards that meet the needs of those students. Um, this can happen for the first part. While this is happening, what group B is doing 
asynchronously, because of course, synchronously group A is working with you live, asynchronously group B would be working on Spanish language arts, integrated with science, but again, via a asynchronous video um, or a different task. So for example, group A could be working with you on oracy building and background in a whole group setting, and then group B could be working on watching a video to build background on that same content. In the afternoon, group A then logs back on and starts looking at and starts working on math in English. And again, this is a great time for the interventionist. This could be broken up from the 60 minutes to 30 and 30. However, or how much support you do have from interventionists and or instructional support. Um, with this happening, again, group B is working asynchronously with the same building background within those math concepts. And then group B goes after group A and vice versa. You notice that on Wednesday's plan, you see everything is asynchronous learning. So students will be doing something that is already already in a video form um, for them to accomplish on the Wednesdays, but still focusing on the same content and SLA standards and math or social studies and, and English. This is a great time where PLCs with our dual language teachers can get together and collaborate and meet and plan for these weeks. Um, then you notice on Thursdays and Fridays um, at the end of the week, Science again, SLA and science integration are constant, but then in the afternoon, we're going to see social studies integrated with English language arts. And again, with the same pattern, group A would be working um, synchronously with the teacher while group B is working asynchronously, and then they would rotate um, within that time frame. So again, what does this clearly tell us? It clearly tells us that all students do receive literacy instruction in both languages every day at the beginning of entry to the program. So this comes back to our biliteracy guidelines. This schedule does reflect that they are together for differentiated but not separate instruction, which again, whole group and then smaller intervention groups that can be used. In pre-K five, content and literacy are integrated as you see um, oops, on the chart. And then content, whether it be science, social studies, and math, is taught in one language only at each grade level. That is where the language and content allocation comes into play. So it's the consistency for students, the consistency of our teachers to ensure these blocks of integration. Um, so in conclusion, we come back to this question. How can we continue to schedule for biliteracy during distance learning? We want to make sure it reflects our biliteracy guidelines and staying constant. We want to make sure it continues to reflect our vision, um, pedagogy, allocation plan, and integration. And we definitely want to make sure that it reflects flexibility and new learning. So, and now Andrea, what she will get to do with us today, will offer more examples on how to continue to teach for biliteracy during distance learning using a schedule like this. Thank you, Crystal. Um, so now I'm going to share my screen to be able to continue our session here. And I will be, let's see. I will be addressing this question on what does instruction look like in an example schedule as Crystal did share. So I know Crystal was talking about how you can have your whole group time and then you would be able to chunk up into smaller groups. You can absolutely do that in half class sizes or even smaller. What worked for me in the spring was having groups of four to five students. So the very first thing that you should always do and this matches what you would do in person, is work on building relationships. Because unless you build relationships, you won't be able to establish those trust, the connection with your students, especially for those kinder students coming in that are meeting you for the very first time. If you have flexibility within your schedule, that first week of school, if you are able to set up meetings one-on-one -on -one with families to be able to introduce yourself, 
show them pictures of you or even bitmojis to talk about what you like and just get to um, know them. That would be incredible. But again, you need that flexibility and support from administrators. But I highly recommend doing this before jumping into rigorous instruction. Um, okay, so our next thing. As we know, when we're building Oracy in person, we use strategies such as TPR to be able to help students make connections between the content, especially if this is vocabulary taught in a language that is not native to them. And as you work on establishing these TPR motions, you can use um, this trick that I learned on YouTube to make, take photos of yourself to make GIFs. So that way, if you are gonna send students to work asynchronously, they can have access to those TPR motions and practice at home with the support of their parents or other siblings. So when they do come live again with you in a lesson, they can um, start participating more with confidence because they were able to take what you've done with them and practice more independently. Another thing that we do in the classroom are simple concept attainments where you can have students um, work at their tables to make sense of what these images are and how this is going to relate to their unit. You can absolutely do this virtually as well with the use of PowerPoint or Google Slides. You can have your small group. As you can see here on my right, I have myself and my four students that we're engaging in this concept attainment. You can even have it manipulating or interactive so students can manipulate um, the screen so they can click and drag versus the teacher um, taking lead of it. The next big thing that we, um, we do as teachers when we have our read alouds, um, we try to make them interactive, right? In class, we're changing our voices to have the students be engaged, but how can you do this virtually? Well, what worked for me, um, I did a lot of scavenger hunts and I made stu the students get up because if we're sitting for too long, we always get antsy and we know the students will absolutely uh, feel the same. You can use simple text to do basic concepts with the, uh, the younger students such as colors or positional words or sharing um, or ways to build acceptance of others. You can also use your text to incorporate more of the unit so students can find something in their home that matches what the unit is talking about. Um, or they can even act out scenes and that can help them practice dialogue, understanding character traits, or reading with expression. So I'm going to show you some sample text. Um, and when we are thinking about sample text that match our unit, we want to make sure we're being very st strategic when picking out our resources because we want them to match what our unit um, is addressing, as well as the standards. We can't um, go too far away from that. We want to make sure we are addressing the standards because in an integrated um, biliteracy unit, we have not only the language arts standards, but we have our content standards. So if your standards are asking for students to write pieces with dialogue, you can pick texts like this where students can interact with the text, see the different taglines, and even practice um, the dialogue that's going on in there. Another thing you can do when um, you're doing text, if you want to incorporate foundational skills, you can take your PowerPoint or your presentation out of presenter mode so that students can manipulate these little boxes like you see here in yellow and students can click and drag over the words that they built TPR on or if you're doing prefixes and suffixes or multisyllabic words, students can easily find that within the text that you are reading. Other texts um, are excellent for helping students find textual evidence of character traits, not only from the text itself, but using the images. So again, just thinking back to what, are, what is the standard asking for and what is the text that will allow me to do that. For our younger students, picking familiar text that they will be able to interact with you with and see concepts such as characters and setting, um, along with punctuation marks that they will be able to incorporate again with their writing. And thinking about that writing, if your summative is asking for a specific um, project like a letter, they're going to write a letter at the end of their unit. You want to find those mentor texts, um, such as this one here that's 
demonstrating and modeling letter writing so students can not only read text with it, but be able to use it towards their own final projects. Here's another example of integrating what you're doing with your unit, with text. Um, if you are studying a bigger concept such as traditions, that might be hard for students to understand right away, especially behind a screen. So you want to always think back, okay, how can I slow this down? How can I relate it to what my students already know? No, um, so here's an example of teeth. How many students have lost their teeth? <laughs> Everybody, right? So using a concept of their teeth will help them um, share not only what their tradition is, what do they do with their teeth? Do they have the tooth fairy? Do they have the little ratoncito? Um, and then they can read texts about what, the, uh, what other countries around the world do. In terms of writing, um, that, look, that, that concept seems so hard, like how can you have students write? Um, what works for me is I found this little paper from Google Images, I put it in because I want my students to be able to write at home. So if, I ma if my paper matched what they were doing, to me just help them um, be able to complete the task, especially if I was very concerned about their spacing or their line writing. So if I was doing the, the cycle of the butterfly and I wanted to see if students were grasping the concept, we would be able to have a conversation. Okay, well, why don't you tell me like what happens first? What is this first stage in the cycle? So then I would type directly what the student is doing or saying, and then I would put their initials the way I would do it in person. So that way the student can feel proud that, oh, okay, this is my work. I'm taking ownership and look what I did. In terms of videos, how can you further deepen your, um, your units? You can create videos yourself. This is a sample of um, what my colleague and I have done. So it's really short, just showing how I can take the concept of forces in motion and demonstrate it in my, well, this could be school, but you can even do it at home. And if you're not comfortable doing that, there's good old YouTube. You just have to make sure you watch the videos ahead, ahead of time so that way there's no explicit language or any inappropriate commercials that can come on while you're with your students. Math is a big one. How can we help students with manipulatives, especially if you don't start with them the first day of school so you can send home manipulatives. Um, this is a really good resource. Each of these can click onto um, an interactive page where students can use Unifix cubes or counters um, to be able to support them as they interact with their math concepts. And lastly, I wanted to share the three linguistic spaces with you because once we are able to return to an in-person setting, we want our students to be able to transition flawlessly without being confused as to what is in their surroundings. So in person, we would have our linguistic spaces. If you are a one teacher model that teaches um, instruction in both of the program languages, you would have all three walls. If you are a two teacher model and you only teach in one of the program languages, then you would have two of the walls. But this is an example of my Spanish wall where everything is color coded. So this is what the students will actually see in person. Same thing with the English wall and I can always interact with my students virtually and show them, oh, okay, we just learned about rules. Let's put it in our wall because this is what we do. And then our bridge wall. So you can see where the languages come together. And again, it's color coded. So these are just simple things that you can do for your students to help with understanding but by literacy framework, by literacy education, and how they can take this and go back into life um, without feeling confused or anything. So now um, that we can see, we know what good instruction looks like and what by literacy best practices are, we can see how they are applicable, applicable um, in the virtual setting. So now I'm gonna give it to Olga so she can show you how you can take the organization of your booth and translate it into the classroom. Thank you, Andrea. And now we're going to answer a few questions that have come up for us in the field. And it starts with this big question right here. And I am adjusting my screen so you can see it well. We start off 
thinking about how do I teach a booth during virtual or hybrid instruction? Because most likely your booths were not planned this way. So now we acknowledge that and we wanna be sure that we can answer some of these questions. So I'd like to frame this by thinking about four specific questions that we wanna ask ourselves as we plan with our teams. And the questions are right here. What units will our grade level teach? Which parts of the unit should be taught asynchronously, or as we have been saying, offline? And which parts should be taught synchronously, online? What lessons will result from the unit's learning outcomes? And what are the best strategies that help us teach the unit's learning outcomes and big ideas? Most likely when you planned, you planned the standards a la year long. So you have a map that reflects that. And so the first question that you need to answer is, is it realistic to have your students doing all of the units or should you select some for them to do? Because we are planning for developing bilinguals, we are being strategic with this unit map. And therefore, what we want to do is have clear expectations about what is realistic. So that's the first question you need to answer. Then you also need to think about your actual structures of your unit. If you plan what you have there already, you want to think about what needs to be taught uh, online and what can be taught offline. And the way we need to think about that is by thinking about our concepts as concrete and going to the more abstract. A way to help us do that is reading your, starting with your unit storyline. So as a PLC, you can read this together and that clearly begins to give you an idea of how it is that you're gonna have to structure these pieces of instruction. And you're gonna have to make decisions about what it is that can be done online and offline so that you set your students up really well when they're not with you online so they can continue to learn on their own. And the way we're going to approach this is as always by utilizing the backwards planning model, right? We want to always identify our desired results. We want to determine the acceptable evidence that our students are going to produce through this learning. And then we get to have that fun engagement time with our PLC and colleagues about planning the learning experiences and instruction for our students. This is going to help you succeed. When you get to the actual planning of mini lessons, what you want to think about is what lessons will result from the unit's learning outcomes. Again, we wanna use the language of going from concrete to abstract, and this applies both to synchronously as well as asynchronously. So what you want to think about is what kinds of verbs are being shown here in my outcomes. If you notice Andrea and Crystal both mention groupings and they mentioned, um, Andrea mentioned strategies. And these are the outcomes that are gonna help us plan those strategies and, and effortlessly also be able to think about what is concrete and moving towards what is abstract with examples, with videos, with whatever it might be. But this takes speaking honestly with your colleagues again about what is realistic. We also want to be sure that the strategies you're, you're using and the supports that you're going to use match your learning outcomes and your big ideas. Because as we think about our learners, as we think about our plan, we definitely want to utilize the best strategies that are gonna match those learning outcomes and those big ideas. And as you saw, Andrea gave some, some visuals as to what that would look like. So we definitely want to consider uh, the groupings as well as the strategies. When, am I, when is it okay for us to do whole group instruction online or offline, right? And when is it okay for me to, to meet with my students in small groups to help them? Again, all of this is going to be determined in your common conversations about your unit's learning outcomes and big ideas. If you would like to uh, continue to follow up on strategies or learn more about certain strategies, a good resource is the Teaching for Biliteracy text. Uh, chapter six is a great resource for you to consider. In addition, always remember that 
WIDA has identified three kinds of supports that are essential for language learners. And every lesson plan should incorporate these as you are planning for your students. They will also help you be able to achieve the desired outcomes. So as you meet with your stakeholders, your, your colleagues, your PLC teams, even parents, when you have clear expectations, when you have answers to these four questions, you are able to communicate your plan for them. And you're also able to meet the desired outcomes for your students to have the best experiences because this is about them. Um, Susan is actually now going to help us by showing some of the resources that we might want to consider as we plan for our virtual or hybrid instruction. Okay, so I want to start the conversation about resources and tools by just giving you a framework for how to think about uh, all the stuff that you're seeing out there. So when we think about resources and tools, we want to think about how those resources and tools can help you connect, communicate, and collect. So we know that distance learning requires that we make um, special and intentional efforts to connect with students and families. And Andrea talked about um, the importance of building relationships and building trust. So when you're looking at a resource or a tool, how is that resource going to help you connect with students? Um, how is it going to allow you as the teacher to share with students? And how is it going to allow students to share with each other? And finally, because families play such a crucial um, role in learning at home, um, how is the resource or tool going to facilitate the ability of families to connect with you as a teacher, to connect with um, their students, and to be involved in their students' learning? You also want to think about how the resources and tools are going to help you communicate. So communication is an essential part of teaching. And we know that in any um, group, there's a variety of preferences and strengths in communication styles. So as teachers, we need to be responsive to that. And as you consider resources and tools, you need to consider how it's going to help you communicate um, with students and with families. So the resources and the tools need to support you as the teacher in being able to communicate what you want students to learn, to communicate your instruction. And they also need to be appropriate for the age, the developmental level, and the language level of students. Um, and finally, how does the resource or the tool that you're considering help you to collect information? How can it help you gather the evidence that you're going to need to um, you know, make sure that students are learning what you are um, intending for them to learn. So one resource that um, I think uh, functions as a nice uh, kind of launching page is this um, Bitmoji classroom that has become so popular. So it's a great tool, it's a great launching pad or a gateway that you can create and then adapt according to the unit or to the instructional focus that you have at the moment. Um, these examples are from Andrea's uh, PowerPoint. And um, in terms of uh, teaching for biliteracy, this Bitmoji classroom is a great way to set up your three linguistic spaces virtually, as Andrea described earlier, um, and also to create your um, bilingual classroom library. So the link on this page shows um, several examples, and it actually has some tutorials on how to use this um, to set up your virtual um, classroom. Another tool um, that is really great is this uh, directory that the School Library Journal has um, created. And so they've done a great job of compiling guidelines that publishers have articulated. This is a resource that helps to facilitate your ability to connect with students. So we've seen a lot of um, resources come through where authors are doing read alouds of their own stories or there are other teachers reading stories, uh, for example, on YouTube. But really students wanna hear you, their teacher reading to them. And so this is a resource that allows you to kind of know what the rules are so that you can do that. It also allows you to use the resources that you were already going to use anyway, right? So the um, physical paper uh, copies of books that you were going to use. 
I did want to share uh, some resources, some websites that uh, offer some resources in Spanish that you can use for read alouds or for small group instruction. Now, this is going to require a little bit of flexibility on your part because uh, typically the most popular books, the ones that you're used to um, using in paper, aren't necessarily available on these websites in um, virtual format. However, if you can be a little bit flexible, uh, these sites offer some great um, books that are related to the topics that we typically tend to cover in our units. So they're not going to necessarily be the same books in your current curriculum, uh, but they are useful resources. So uh, Unite for Literacy uh, has about 120 uh, free, which is the best part, ebooks for young children. And they're um, kind of like those early readers that you would use in a small group uh, setting. And so you can use them in a large group setting uh, for the purpose of you know, content, but then you can also use them for small group reading instruction or even to assign uh, for homework. Uh, and so the topics are, are uh, connected to what young children and their families are uh, interested in and living. And these even have uh, narrated audio support. So you can listen to them. Uh, and they are in Spanish, uh, as well as a collection in English. Will Books has uh, something similar. They uh, offer some of their books uh, for free. And then if you get a subscription, which is pretty reasonably priced, uh, you can get access to their entire collection. But same idea with books that can be used for small group instruction. These two uh, sites are better for read aloud type books. So the Spanish experiment actually has several uh, fairy tale slash fable like uh, stories that you can access. And then the um, International Children's Digital Library has uh, books actually in about 50 languages. So if you have a program that is other than English and Spanish, this is a good place to go look to find uh, things that you can read aloud uh, in several languages. And finally, I wanted to share a couple of websites that are good for um, articles and passages. Uh, and these are good for second grade and up. So if you teach in those grades, uh, both of these websites offer articles and passages at that are leveled. And in some cases, the same article that can be accessed at a variety of different levels. Uh, both websites also provide instructional materials to support learning that stems from the articles or the passages. Um, they have resources, again, that are related to current events. So if you're doing units on, you know, COVID or anything that's happening in the world, uh, or you're basing your units on phenomena, uh, these are good places to look for um, resources. Uh, New ZLA can be searched freely, but um, full access does require a subscription. Common Lit is actually a nonprofit organization, and so everything that they have is actually available for free. So all of these websites have um, uh, resources in Spanish and in English, and so you can actually use these websites to resource both your Spanish units and your English units. Now I'm going to pass it to Melody, who will talk about how administrators can support uh, all of these strategies and ideas. Thanks, Susan. Yeah, thank you. So now I'm going to share my screen to um, further discuss how administrators or site-based instructional leaders can support biliteracy. Sorry, there we go. So how is it that site-based instructional leaders can continue to support uh, by literacy. The first place to start is to continue to support um, and protect the program goals. And the program goals can be illustrated in our logo, logo which um, denotes deep levels of bilingualism and biliteracy in Spanish and deep levels of bilingualism and, bi um, and literacy in English. And so 
if this is the biling developing bilingual student, we want to ensure that they're still receiving instruction in Spanish and receiving instruction in English in order to develop into this um, proficient um, bilingual. And we can do this by embracing the multilingual perspective. Oftentimes, um, as mandates come down to us, they come down to us in the form of uh, the monolingual perspective or the monolingual curriculum. And because our goals for biliteracy are different, we want to ensure that we are always uh, looking for that multilingual perspective uh, to develop our bilingual learners. Um, this um, includes ensuring instruction follows your program's content and language allocation plan as Crystal shared earlier with us. And protecting time for the development and use of the non-English language. And this moves us to um, the second way that site-based instructional leaders can support biliteracy, which is supporting and protecting the program pedagogy. For this, we can look at uh, the bilingual common core. If we look at the forward of the bilingual common core, we see that they espouse um, contextualized literacy instruction. So rather than finding a separate time for reading and a separate time for writing and a separate time for language and uh, word study development, we need to find a, um, a time and show students how these three systems work together. They should never be taught in isolation, but rather in conjunction with each other. And for our developing bilinguals, we want to make sure that literacy instruction is always contextualized. So in order to support and protect the program's pedagogy, we want to communicate the need for instruction to contextualize literacy development and require instructional time that is dedicated to oracy development especially prior to independent literacy practice. As Crystal uh, stated during her section, one of the things that we also want to do to support by literacy is support our students and families. Uh, we want to make sure that we um, set up a safe space to inquire about how students and families are doing, especially our fragile students, and to reach out to them frequently and create a safe way for families to communicate with school personnel if a uh, status changes. Um, and remember that instruction at home is new for them too. So constantly communicating with them um, regarding how um, the expectations are for uh, distant learning or virtual learning. As um, Andrea shared, we want to make sure that we um, develop relationships with our families. So a site-based instructional leader can require time um, for teachers to spend building relationships with their students and families to get to know them. Because we know that students learn better when they have a relationship with their families. Also, it might be helpful to limit the number of virtual platforms used for communication. This is um, important, especially for families who have multiple children. We, uh, rather than giving them so many virtual platforms that they have to learn, if we limit the number of virtual platforms, it ensures comprehensibility for the family. And we want to communicate to the families how to elevate and use the non-English language at home and how, what the expectations are for student engagement and student work and how much support the parents will have to provide since this is new for them too. The next way that site-based instructional leaders can support by literacy is to remember something by Maya Angelou. She said that she's learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And so as we support teachers, we need to remember to over communicate our expectations in a safe way. So if we are expecting that teachers provide instruction with their curriculum, the expectation that the curriculum be the same uh, needs to shift because the platform has changed. And so if you're going to do what Olga said to prioritize particular units over others, 
uh, support them and encourage them in their decision. And as they select the different outcomes that they will provide instruction aligned to in this virtual environment, again, support them and encourage them because they will feel nervous about not teaching the same things that they used to in a face-to-face -face format. Secondly, limit the expectation of how many new tools and platforms they, they use. Teachers might be learning a variety of new things. Susan shared virtual books. Andrea shared different links and uh, tools that students can use. Um, again, Susan Chu showed um, resources for second grade or the Bitmoji classroom. And we also have uh, the Google Classroom. It's important to remember that teachers are learners in this too, and they need time to feel proficient in the use of these different platforms. So go back to help teachers rationalize which tool would be best for me to connect with students and families, which tool would be best to communicate what I want to communicate, and which tool would be the best one to help me collect the kind of evidence that I would like. And then lastly, um, frequently check in with teachers and PLCs to ensure that they understand your expectations. And because things are changing so quickly, um, to update them on any particular changes in a safe environment, and then provide time for them to meet with the right people. So if you have a dual language strand and a traditional strand, maybe during this time, it makes more sense for just the dual language strand to meet together since their goal is different from the monolingual strand. The last way for how site-based instructional leaders can support by literacy is to ensure that you are taking the time to support yourself. Remember that we are all learners. This is new to all of us. The situation is hard for all of us, but the school doesn't function without a site-based instructional leader. Therefore, be sure to develop a safety net of people to reach out to for ideas and suggestions. Know that your situation and your school is unique. Therefore, you might reach out to a variety of people to gain ideas and then adapt them to your unique situation. Also communicate your stress and tell others how they can help you. This includes teachers. That may help clarify why things are going a certain way or it might um, allow others to help you to ease your stress. And then lastly, take care of yourself so that you can take care of your school because the school won't function without your leadership. And now for our closing, Cheryl Euro. Thank you so much, Melody. Thank you to the whole team. I'm gonna share my screen too. So, oh, you don't want to see my dog. Let me just get this. So in summary, um, as we're challenged to go to take dual language from a traditional setting to a hybrid or online setting, we um, are, we, we hope that these strategies and resources are going to help you. And so let's just summarize that a little bit. Crystal began talking about um, reminding us that we need to start with empathy and we need to really think about looking at our students and our scheduling and the decisions we make from a multilingual perspective. And as we make decisions to keep in mind the vision and goal of dual language. Then Andrea also emphasized the need to make connections with our students and uh, that although we are moving to an online forum or a virtual forum, we're still teaching integrated units, oracy, content, literacy. And to that end, we need to use our strategies in a very strategic way. And Andrea showed us the wonderful strategies that we can use. Then Olga, oopsie, I'm sorry, I went the wrong way. Olga reminded us that as we move online, less is more. While we're still teaching in an integrated way, 
we have to make decisions about how much we're going to teach and these decisions need to be made in a collaborative manner. Um, Susan showed us some resources that we can use. She began by emphasizing the fact that we need to think how resources can help us communicate, connect, and gather information about our students. And she gave us an abundance of online resources that we can use. Finally, Melody uh, suggested how administrators can uh, support this work, and she gave us some guidelines to think about. And we really hope that this webinar, this recording, provided you some resources as you move on to make some of these decisions. We have more resources on our website as well. Our website is free. We hope you sign up, um, especially sign up for the newsletter. We'll be sending out additional resources and additional links via the newsletter. Um, we also have events. We hope that you sign up for events. Right now, our events are all online. Um, so we will be modeling some of this online professional development and online teaching that you'll be doing. Um, we are the Center for Teaching for Biliteracy. Thank you for spending your time with us. We hope that these resources and guidelines uh, help you make decisions for moving online, for connecting with students, for connecting with your families. And we hope to see you in person or in a virtual professional development event soon. Thank you.